Hello, I'm Bruce Lorenz, and this show is entitled Bruce on the Loose. And we've changed up a little bit in our pande pandemic situation. Uh, the governor uh, recently, in fact yesterday, indicated that seven counties would need to go ahead and use masks. Uh, Medina County and Wadsworth in particular are not included in that, but I again want to emphasize to everyone how important it is to, to use your mask and to be uh, safe distance from people. And I'm going to go ahead and remove it at this time and go ahead and put my hat on to set the tone for the book today. And it is called Casey at the Bat. And it was written, believe it or not, way back in 1888. The author was Ernest L. Thayer and the illustrator C. F. Payne. And I know many of my uh, young uh, readers are also very good authors, so you could go ahead and maybe a little project, you could go ahead and uh, write a book of your own. And also uh, seeing some of the projects that some of the uh, elementary students have, have been involved in, uh, many of you are very good artists. And so you might illustrate a book or several pages of something you, that is around your house to go ahead and, and continue your art abilities. And that's really important because I think uh, Mr. Payne here really goes ahead and helps uh, to go ahead and get the idea of this book. And he uh, really does a wonderful job with the illustration. And all books need good illustrators. And of course, the first page shows some modern seats. That In fact, those seats could be at Progressive Field. They look like those green, hard plastic seats that we enjoy going to games. And again, uh, we will see baseball right around the corner on the 24th day of this month, and that's, uh, that's fantastic. So Casey at the Bat, A Ballad of the Republic, sung in the year 1888. They indicated that was, the, that was how they did it back then. And you will see some different words used that we don't usually use, and uh, they certainly do not like the umpire. Uh, believe it or not, there was only one umpire in those uh, regular season games. Sometimes they had two, but very rarely indeed. So let's go ahead and take a real close look at uh, what the illustrator has done. Uh, take a look at the fans and the action and what is happening in uh, Casey at the Bat. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two, but one inning more to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Burroughs did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. So they were not real happy how things were going. A struggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. And you might see Casey. He's in the corner here. He's got a bat in his hand, and he is kind of hoping hoping really hard that he might get an opportunity. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a Lulu, and the latter was a cake. So upon the stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn drove a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted, and the men saw what had occurred, there was Johnny safe at second, and Flynn a hug in third. Then then from 5,000 throats and more there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the flat. 
for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt, t'was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance glared in Casey's eyes, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the steady batsman, the ball unheaded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, said the umpire. From the bleachers black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the belting of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire, shouted someone in the, on the stands. And it's likely they've had killed him, had Casey not raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, Great Casey's vintage shone. He stilted the rising multitude. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two. Fraud, cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered, Fraud. But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they know that Casey wouldn't let the next ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this fabled land, the sun is shining bright. The, bland, the band is playing somewhere and somewhere hearts are light, and somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. So I hope you enjoyed Casey at the bat. It certainly uh, does go back a long way. And here is uh, a note from the author about that uh, about this fine poem. Ernest L. Thayer was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts on August 14, 1863. He grew up near Worcester, Massachusetts, attended Harvard College, and worked at the San Francisco Daily Examiner. He wrote news stories, editorials, and ballads, as well as humorous columns that he signed with the nickname Plym. In February 1888, they returned to the East Coast to join the family's wood manufacturing business. The months later, three months later, he sat down and wrote Casey. He sent it to the examiner while on June 3, 1888, it was printed on the editorial page and signed Plin. Readers inter 
interrupted, interpreted Thayer's Mudville 9 as a California League club that had sunk to the bottom of the league standings. Three of the characters in the poem, Blake, Cooney, and Flynn, were the names of three well-known California League players. So that certainly gives you a little bit of background on Casey at the bat. It really, it's kind of ironic that it was uh, developed and first read in San Francisco because early, early baseball, organized baseball, of course, 1869 had its origins in Cincinnati, Ohio, but there was no team west of St. Louis. So St. Louis was uh, really the, the outreach of the American and National League, which really form, formulated in 1901. And they did, the West Coast did not have teams until 1958 when the Los Angeles Dodgers moved from Brooklyn and the uh, New York Giants became the San Francisco Giants. So that was a, a long way in between that uh, no West Coast team was even there. So I thought that was uh, kind of interesting. Also, uh, one, uh, there was a performer in vaudeville who, Devon Hooper, who performed this uh, poem over 10,000 times. So he really got uh, his uh, claim to fame by doing this in vaudeville was light entertainment from the 1890s to early the 1930s. It consisted of 10 to 15 unrelated acts such as singers, dancers, magicians, acrobats, comedians, jugglers, and also trained animal acts. So that really was something that really promoted Casey at the Bat. And if you looked at some of the pictures, you will notice that there, there were very few women, there were very few ladies, in the game and really the situation is that they it was pretty rough uh, language and the certainly the people uh, got on the umpires we talked about that for a moment and ladies really didn't become uh, regular patrons of the game until much much later so again this was uh, again written in 1888 and there were very few ladies and the men dressed up it was, a, it was a public formal affair, and they had suits and ties on, and they really went ahead and dressed up for the occasion. It was very, very interesting to see what they wore to the game. And uh, usually, again, they only had one umpire, and then we mentioned er, uh, before there was two at very critical games. And in all of uh, the history of baseball, there were only 10 umpires that were inducted in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Jock O'Conlon was one, Billy Evans, uh, and also there was uh, Tom Conley, Tom Al Bartolick, and also uh, Bill Clean was, were four of the umpires that uh, were elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And uh, again, this was, uh, some of the language was very different than what we're maybe used to. One other uh, comparison I can make uh, to Casey at the bat is taking a look at maybe two very, very good players that were in Major League Baseball, both in the American League. Ted Williams, he was the last man to hit 400. He hit 406 in 1941, and he donated much time and effort and finances to Dana-Farber's Jimmy Fund and the pediatric care partner, Boston Children's Hospital. Um, his on-base percentage was an unbelievable 482. In other words, he got on base almost half the time with base on balls, wild pitches or pass ball, hit by pitch, errors, fielder's choices, and also hits. That was just unbelievable. And he served in the Marine Corps, and he really almost lost four years out of his career. In World War II, he was a Marine pilot, and he also served in the Korean War. And believe it or not, he met and became very close friends with an Ohioan that we know a little bit about, John Glenn. 
who was the first astronaut to circle the globe. And, and uh, Ted Williams tells us baseball is the only field of endeavor where a man can succeed three times out of ten and be considered a good performer. And, of course, he was in, elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame. He had 93% positive uh, situation, and he didn't always get along with the media very well. And, and rumor had it he never, on his last at bat, he hit a home run, and the fans implored him at Fenway Park to tip his hat, and he never tipped his fat hat to the fans, which was very, very different indeed. We also had a gentleman who you probably have heard a little bit about. That would be Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, need, we need to talk about Babe Ruth a little bit and what he did for the game of baseball. He was a superb pitcher with Major League Baseball. A lot of people don't know that, but his record was 94 wins and only 46 losses with a 2.27 earned run average. In 1919, the Boston Red Sox sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees for a sum of $25,000. What a steal indeed by the New York Yankees. His 29 home runs in 1919 was better than the total of 10 teams. In 1930, he hit 54 homers, beating 15 teams. And in 1927, he hit 60. That figure bested 12 teams, and that was a record that lasted until 1961 when Roger Maris hit 61 home runs. He totaled 714 home runs in his career, which stood until Hank Aaron broke that record in 1974. A very interesting tidbit about uh, Babe Ruth. His contract for $80,000 in 1930 was higher than the President of the United States' as Hubert Hoover's $75,000. When asked about it, the Bambino said, I had a better year. So that tells you a little bit about Babe Ruth's brashness and his uh, bravado and what he thought about his abilities. Uh, and certainly baseball has given us so many hundreds of movies and uh, enjoyable uh, pastime that you can go ahead and pull up and get all sorts of uh, movies of recent times, of uh, all sorts of opportunities to keep up on your history of uh, baseball in America. Someone said if someone visited from Europe and they said, if you want to know the culture of America, you have to know baseball because it is a, it is a marathon. It currently uh, is, has just a 60-game schedule, which opens the 23rd and 24th of July, but regularly it's 162 games. And you can go ahead and every day of the, of the year when the season starts in late March until the World Series is over, there's going to be a game. Uh, NPR had a story recently about some high school graduates from California. They traveled to all 30 Major League Baseball stadiums. And they said it was something they couldn't do in other sports. They couldn't do it like in football because they might have a Monday or a Thursday or Sunday game, but that would be difficult to go ahead because it's really more on a weekly basis than baseball being each and every day. So I hope you have learned a little bit from Casey at the bat and realize that things aren't always going to go your way, that you're going to have opportunities. In fact, uh, we have a schematic here somewhere that Babe Ruth struck out 1,330 times in his career. So that means he did hit 714 home runs we mentioned, but he failed, he failed miserably 1,330 times. So even he, the greatest, probably the greatest home run hitter we'll ever know, had difficulties and problems. So really stick to it. If at first you don't succeed, Maybe uh, tweak things, try things a little differently, and uh, never give up. And our fans, we certainly, in the Casey book, we were 
Fanat fans stand for fanatics. We're really excited about uh, sports coming back on a limited basis, possibly, but we've been waiting for some months without uh, professional sports, and it's certainly something that we're looking forward to. And I thank you for watching Bruce on the Loose. Next week, we'll have two books. We'll feature uh, books that uh, uh, we've read over the, the years, uh, Greedy Zebra b b being one of them, and a uh, walrus that really helps a lot, a lot of people as well. So you take care, and we'll talk to you soon.